Hi, and welcome to our session for the 2020 AECT Virtual Convention. This session is on designing for accessibility and UDL in online, flexible, and hybrid learning. My name is Jennifer Madrill, and I am here today with Beth. Beth, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Beth Oyarzin. Nice to be with you. Beth and I graduated from Old Dominion University uh, in a PhD program there, so it's been really fun to work with her on this project. And if you're interested, we have all of our session materials in a Google folder, so you can use this QR code by holding up your smartphone to the QR code, or you can just hop over to um, the URL at the bottom, bit.ly, you can either do bit.ly.com or bit.ly slash AECT 20 UDL, and that will give you access to this presentation as well as the various uh, handouts and other links that we have um, that we have in our session that we'll be talking about. So as I mentioned in the intro, as far as the topic of our session, we're really focusing on two main areas in our session. I'll be talking about designing for accessibility, which is getting into thinking through the different ways that you can design your instructional materials to support accessibility. And then Beth will be talking about universal design for learning. So Beth, wanna take us through the difference between the two? Sure. Um, accessibility is designing uh, electronic content for users with disabilities, whereas universal design for learning is a little bit broader than that. That's why I have a, the circle and a circle graphic there. Um, it's where you design electronic content or any content for accessibility for all types of users that have more differences than just disabilities. So cultural differences, um, any other types of um, uh, language differences. So the idea is a little bit broader than accessibility. So it's designing for all. That's perfect. That's a great way to express it. This is a research study that I did with quite a few colleagues, as you can see in that long author list, um, <laughs> where we were looking at the familiarity, current use, and interest of uni universal design for learning among online learning instructors. And what we found is that, uh, if you'll do the next slide, um, that um, there's a need for higher education practitioners, researchers, and administrators to um, be trained on the effective application of the UDL principles and guidelines that there isn't much, there's not, there's some knowledge, but, and there's more interest than there is knowledge around these principles. And so uh, that uh, points to a need for some training to understand it more. And that's really a good segue for what I'd like to talk about. Last year at about this time, we did a session for the uh, design and development division as a webinar, and then we followed that up when we were at AECT on designing for accessibility. And as our team was getting together talking about uh, what we could, what we should focus on and how we could frame things, it really became clear that some people are very new to this and don't even know what they don't know. And so that was really the point of um, what we did in our sessions last year. And we relied very heavily on this website. It's from the National Center on Accessible Educational Materials. And um, they do a really nice job of walking you through the primary uh, considerations in terms of uh, what you need to consider when you're designing instructional materials for, uh, for, for accessibility. So let me just click through real quick and look at this website. And one thing that um, we'll be talking, I'll be talking about in the next couple minutes is they base everything around a framework um, called POUR. And POUR is an acronym, P-O-U-R. So the P is for perceivable. And that is making sure that learners can see and hear your content. The O in the acronym is for operable. So making sure your learners can interact with your content with, an, with a variety of tools. Understandable. Um, this is making sure your learners can understand your content and enjoy a predictable experience. And then finally, R, which is robust, making sure your content works with the, the current and the future technologies that you're using to support the learning experience. And so an easy way to remember it is, like I said, the, the POUR framework, P-O-U-R for perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. And so we took that website and the suggestions that they had presented in terms of making um, making the instructional materials accessible. And we created a resource list. And this is 
partially crowdsourced and partially from that uh, website that I just mentioned. But it follows that framework and I'll click through and give us a sense for what this looks like. Um, but this is a resource that we've shared in our Google folder that you're very welcome to download and make a copy and um, use it as, as you'd like. Um, Beth and I were mentioning when we were putting our session together that I put this out on LinkedIn late last year and it's been shared dozens and dozens of times and people seem to find it to be a nice way to, um, again, figure out ways to be able to make your, your materials accessible based on the, the framework. For example, adding alternative text, there are links out to various helper sites for Microsoft Word or whatever it might be, the tool that you're using. And again, using the, the framework of the poor, um, the poor framework is the way that this helper is, is laid out. Um, and so, like I said, you can go ahead and get a copy of that within our session materials. Okay, and Beth's going to take us through some helper things for universal design for learning. Yes, and uh, the universal design for learning, the guidelines themselves, if you'll move on to the next slide, um, they suggest that you have multiple means of engagement multiple means of representation and multiple, multiple means of action and expression in order for learners to interact with the uh, content and each other. And you can see it's operationalized further. And so there's those are the three guiding principles, um, but then there's nine different um, guidelines, which you can see in the gray boxes there. Uh, and so it's a, it's a robust uh, framework uh, that is overwhelming, I, I think, at times to look at if you're new to it. Um, so we were trying to think along the same lines as Jennifer's um, um, accessibility resources that maybe we could simplify and find some resources to help people um, get started with using this framework. So what we have found and what we've developed, the first one here is a UDL implementation rubric, and you can see who developed it there. And if you can click through, this one's just a, a nice um, one page uh, rubric um, that, that was our article. And um, so it's a one page rubric that you can see uh, how you can get started and what it might look like in a classroom, regardless of whether that classroom is online or face-to-face. -face. So this is more pedagogical or andragogical in nature. Um, so if you're an explorer, it would be all the way on the left. If you were just getting started with UDL and then move through novice, intermediate, advanced, and a UDL idol, which I like that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so this is uh, could be useful if you just want to get ideas or see how it's implemented or to um, use as a tool for peer evaluation of someone else or classmates if you're implementing this in some instruction. Um, the next one is a little bit more, is another rubric um, that the first rubric I just showed you was adapted from this one. Uh, this one is a little bit more robust. It goes through all the nine guidelines, but um, it's not as, so it's an emerging. So if you're just getting started, uh, what that guideline might look like in a classroom to proficient to progressing. And you can see there's multiple pages here and it goes through each of the nine guidelines um, to give you ideas of how it could be implemented. Yeah, this would be great for professional development or even a self-check, right? When you just yeah, get, you can get yourself involved in UDL, right? Right, if you're gonna design professional development, if you're an instructional designer, this may be a good place to get ideas. If you're an instructor, it'd be a good place to uh, self-assess or or get ideas for your instruction. It could be used for peer evaluation. So I think it's a nice um, tool. Uh, and I like that they have operationalized it into merging, emerging. So this is how I can get started instead of just jumping into uh, the progressing or idle status. And I do think that's really important because um, it, it, it isn't always, as you said, the guidelines when you first look at them can be very overwhelming. And so having a place to jump in, I think is really a nice feature of these um, as well. Absolutely. And then since these rubrics are, are really um, designed and thought about for face-to-face -face teaching, what we wanted to add to it or put out in the resource universe um, and that we're hoping this becomes 
a crowdsourced uh, document too. But what we started here is a is another two toolkit similar to the one Jennifer that um, presented for accessibility. Although this one is for UDL as far as um, online application of UDL and tools. And I tried to, uh, we tried to use the same color coding that they use for EDL for each of the main principles. So the green there is multiple means of engagement and sort of a small definition of what it looks like in an emerging uh, proficient or progressing uh, to take those operations definitions from the rubric. So what, what that might mean and how it might look like in an online environment. And then maybe some tools uh, that would support those different online um, examples. So an emerging way to do multiple means of engagement in an online class might be uh, use a discussion board with a prompt to relate content to interest and experiences. So you're not just answering a generic prompt or reading and summarizing, you're connecting it to your life experiences um, and having students do that. So there's different uh, tools that you could use there um, that might support that. And then moving over to progressive, maybe a long-term collaborative project that is guide that the students set their own goals and guide guide themselves through it with with assistance. Um, so you can sort of see it moves from more direct to more self-directed from the learner side. And I think this really ties into what you said at the beginning too, Beth. That this is really just good design, right? Just good design it for learning. Is. Yes. Uh, and it could be applied to face-to-face -to -face or online environments, but it's really picked up traction in the online learning research. And I think because, because of the accessibility issues, and I think um, it's necessary for online learning to not just be accessible, but to be quality, good online design, course design online learning for students. Well, it's not just showing a slide and taking a quiz, showing a slide and taking <laughs> right. a quiz. Right, right. And so you can scroll through, and this one is a couple of pages and it goes through different all the three different um, principles of UDL in the same fashion that I just went over for the engagement. Um, and at the top, you'll see we created a link to a Google form. If you have any ideas um, that you want added to this or for improvement, feel free to email us or you can click on that link at the top to let us know uh, what could be added to improve this resource. I think that's great. And I can't wait to use it in my, my next class with my students, that's great. And then for those of us that are in the live session on Saturday, we hope you come with your comments and your questions. Yep, we look forward to talking to you.